In my last film, I used the pot bottle analogy for why some autistic people shut down or melt down. And that analogy imagines a person's emotional landscape to be like a bottle of carbonated drink. And each moment of stress in their day shakes the bottle until there comes a point where the pressure inside overwhelms and squirts out. Those that understand autism as a behaviour difference, not a brain difference, might say that the child is overreacting. It's a good word to watch out for. Every child faces difficulties at school. Everyone's pop bottle is shaken through the school day. That doesn't give us the right to throw our toys out of the pram, to have an outburst. The child should learn how to behave and they should learn how to control themselves and so on and so on. Let's be very clear. Meltdown and shutdowns are not things people can control. A person viewing autism as a behaviour difference may view meltdown and shutdown as akin to tantrums over which people can have a modicum of control and they're not the same thing. Misunderstandings like this blame the child for the difficulties they face and lead to decreases in self-esteem and damage to mental health. It's akin to telling a child who's a wheelchair user that they should just try harder to walk. It fundamentally ignores the physiological differences between these children. These films are to get you thinking and reflecting and in like three minutes I cannot possibly give you a comprehensive understanding of autistic neurology and I wouldn't claim to have one myself but what I will do is a whistle stop tour, a whistle -stop tour of some of those key differences and look at what their implications might be for that shaking up of a child through a school day. So for example Autistic people often have heightened visual perception. The neurotransmitter GABA, which acts as a dampener on visual perception in a neurotypical person's brain, doesn't work in autistic brains. So detail and movement in the world around us stand out more than they do to non-autistic persons. Have you ever been in an environment that was just too visually loud for you, or where there was too much going on to concentrate? That's the bottle being shaken up, the visual environment in a school. There are connectivity differences in autistic brains. Greater connectivity can mean a person is good at taking in a lot of information and detail on a particular topic, but that same increase in connectivity can also mean that a person is easily overwhelmed. They are, in a sense, taking in more information than a non-autistic person, and that's shaking the bottle up. There was, there was a piece of research that found that autistic brains at rest produce 42% more information than non-autistic brains, so it's, it's busy in there. Um, they might be having to perform consciously what other people do instinctively, because their brain hasn't got the instinctive capacity to perform those tasks. So, for example, remembering what facial expressions to make, or concentrating on the tone of their voice, or their vocal modulation, or remembering when it is or is not their turn to talk in a conversation, and so on. And it's exhausting. You know, have you ever taken part in an activity that was not conducted in your mother tongue, where you had to translate as you were doing it? The cognitive load of doing that translation is knackering. And that's essentially what many autistic people are doing on a daily basis. They're translating social worlds whilst trying to do the task at hand. And there are further differences. There are differences with perception of time, with emotional processing, with understanding, with pain and expressions of pain. There are differences in sleep, there are hormonal differences, and there, there are a great many significant tangible differences between autistic brains and non-autistic brains. And additionally, with regards to that shaking, it can be a very lonely experience to be different to your peers. And to, and to be different from the adults supporting you. Because for whatever reason, you know, different race, different sexuality, different religion, etc. Those who have like me peers and like me adults supporting them can see themselves in others, can learn through watching how others do things, are guided by people who know something for what it feels like to be in their shoes. And the autistic child rarely has access to that in that sort of ever-present support that a neurotypical child or somebody in a neuro majority or a group majority would have. Indeed, sometimes they may be actively misguided by the well-intentioned presumption that what works for me will work for you, that doesn't recognise that fundamental difference. What can you do? 
You can find out about strategies that directly support autistic children to access and understand the school day. I'll pop some links below of organisations that offer these sorts of courses. One great perk to doing this is often those strategies also boost the understanding of non-autistic children so they can make the school day easier for everyone. It's things like um, visual timetables and now and next boards and symbolic communication for emotion or basic requests. You can provide support and guidance to the child to process the social and emotional landscape that they're in. Like, imagine if you went on holiday to a completely different culture and whilst you're at dinner you inadvertently deeply offended the locals. It would be a bewildering and frightening experience but if somebody took the time to sit with you and explain it then at least you'd have an understanding of what went on. A great many autistic adults describe the experience of autistic childhood as feeling as if they were aliens visiting a strange and puzzling place. One day we might have a society where people of different neurologies can feel at home together, but for now, taking the time to explain can at least make that place less strange and less puzzling for them to be in. And you can do more of what you're doing already. You can listen to autistic voices like mine. There are so many people willing to help you bridge the neuro divide. I expect you feel very alone in your role. Being a Senko in a school can be really isolating, but you're not alone in wanting to change things and in wanting to make the world a better place for these children. And again, I'll pop links below of organisations that will support you and be alongside you as you make these changes and make these differences. In this film, I've taken a fleeting glance at some of the brain differences experienced by autistic people. I imagine some of you, not, not, no, I don't imagine any of you, I imagine someone um, who'd previously thought of an autistic child as just naughty, faced with this list of brain differences, might be sort of thinking, whoa, they're way more disabled than I realised. But you'll notice that although I've talked about the difficulties faced by autistic children, I've not said these difficulties are caused by autism, because generally they're caused by misunderstandings, and I've not referred to autism as a disability, because although some autistic people are disabled, some are also enabled, and a great many are somewhere in between. In my next film, I'll look at why this is, and what you can do to protect the children in your care from some of the secondary conditions commonly caused to autistic people, which are often far worse in their effects on their lives than the challenges that result from being autistic.